Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Uh, I'm really excited about this episode. Um, Eloi Monard, who has been on this podcast several times, is back to talk about all of the crazy things that have been happening in Latin America, and he invites with him his friend Ignacio Assis, who uh, is a professor in Argentina, also um, a specialist at uh, Fon Plata Development Bank. Um, it was a really, really great conversation. We talked about what happened, what has happened in Guatemala, Argentina, and Ecuador over the last week or two. We probably could have gone on talking for hours considering everything that's going on. But this was a good introductory conversation to give you a lay of the land and some tools for about how to think through these things. And we will have both of these gentlemen back on very soon, especially as we hurtle towards election season here in Argentina. Um, otherwise, email me at jacob at cognitive.investments if you want to talk about our asset management services, our research services, or if you have any comments or guest suggestions or anything else related to the podcast. If you haven't rated or reviewed the podcast, uh, we're stuck at 119 ratings on Apple. I uh, would love to rocket that number a little bit further. It takes two seconds of your time, helps us immensely. Uh, we've had lots of new listeners uh, come to the podcast in the last month or two. So if you haven't done that, it takes two seconds of your time and it's really, really helpful for us. Otherwise, um, last thing, um, Elohim was nice enough to come on, even though he had a meeting right at the top of the hour. He had a kid who was homesick. I actually didn't get much sleep last night because we're working on a little sleep regression at home here in the Shapiro household. Uh, so please all do allowances for any background noise um, or fumbling through words or things like that. Uh, uh, three guys trying to push through and, and bring you some insights about what's going on in the region. So cheers and see you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. Nacho Elohim, it's so nice to be with you. Um, we have no shortage of things to discuss in Latin America in general. We're not going to get to all of them in the hour that we have set aside. We're going to have to do more conversations in general, but we'll try to cover everything maybe from a high level and come back and do some deeper dives as well. Um, why don't we just start with the election drama we've had in just the past week? So we're recording on August 23rd. This will post on Monday, so not a lot is going to change between now and then. Um, we had primaries in Argentina, we had a first round election in Ecuador, and we had pretty remarkable elections in Guatemala. And my first question to you both, the subject matter experts, is which one of these three is most important? I would I would probably lean towards Guatemala just because it's a final result, but I'm going to leave it to you guys to tell me which is most important and which we should discuss sure. first. That, that's a good question, actually. A really, really good question. I, I don't have an answer. I want to hear from you as well, but I agree. The elections in Guatemala are are very important for the region as well. I think are very important for Central America, also mostly. On the other side, and for very different reasons, on the other side of the spectrums, the, the elections in Argentina speak about another another stage uh, of the Latin America develop the. The uh, election de development, right, and 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 the trends, the world trends, and I agree that both those both of them are, are really important. And having said that, uh, Ecuador is going through a really tough moment, so the elections are very important for them. I why don't why don't we start there then? Because Guatemala is the more. It's the nicer story. It's more, well, it could be the nicer story. It yeah. could be the more optimistic story. It could also be the less nice story. So maybe my first question um, to you both is, do you think these election results stick? Uh, so for, for our listeners, Bernard Arevalo came out of nowhere as this anti-corruption crusader. He does have some name brand recognition. His father was a president during sort of a good time in Guatemala's history before the Civil War began in the 60s. And it's been sort of one bad thing for another since Guatemala since then. But before then, uh, Bernardo's father was a very well-respected politician and president and did lots of things. He came out of nowhere to win this, um, this presidential ele election in a landslide. It wasn't wasn't by the seat of his pants. It wasn't small margins. And I'm wondering if that, the the quality of the landslide is going to protect him. But you've already had, you know, folks in the Guatemalan 
government or officials saying, oh, we're going to ban the party or we're going to raise concerns about voter fraud. And is this thing going to be, is this actually going to be legitimized? So the first question is, do you think that he assumes the presidency? Do you think that there's going to be, does that landslide give him the protection he needs to go in and assume the office of the presidency? Or are you worried that the establishment in Guatemala, which has everything to fear from a real crusader like him, is going to try and block his path? I will I will connect this with the other question too, which is I think that three elections give different messages to Latin America and the region. Mm-hmm. And the question is how these messages evolve. And it's maybe about endurance in one uh in one side and about the Rebelo, I think that the expectations are huge and I'm always very cautious with political expectations because political despair is the quick consequence of a very bad manage of political expectations or maybe as you said because whether the the corrupt coalition in Guatemala or other stakeholders around the region, particularly Central America, could also impact its development. So I am very afraid, really afraid, that this example of a social movement becoming a official government would really create despair, not only in Guatemala, but in the region. So on on that, from that point of view, I would add that for me, it's, so we are, we are experiencing this, uh, this moment of anti uh, pink tide in Latin America, right? So after all the, the left came to government in Latin America, we started seeing the resurgency of uh, extreme rights, um, populist rights, right? But at the first time recently, very lately, we have seen left parties all around Latin America coming to power again, right? in Colombia, in Chile, in Bolivia. Um, and for me, the, the, the what, what Guatemala doesn't, doesn't fit in, in any of those general regional tides um, and ways, right? Uh, which is something that I, that I like because the you see you see a backlash from the conservative conservant more, more conservant parties and the well-established uh, elite in power. <clears throat> I don't think they are going to be able to stop this right now in Guatemala. Because they have already tried, and they 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 couldn't do it, um, and the general support is huge, is massive. Uh, hope st- is still there in the country. You can see it. You can when, whenever you speak with people in the country, they are very they, the, expect, the expectations are high, as you said, Jacob. So I think that cannot be stopped right now. On a different hand. Uh, is the situation in Ecuador and Argentina is pretty different, right? So society and the current state of the country is pretty different. So I, I don't think I, if, no. if I have to 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 bet on that, I think it will be a, pro- a, a, a process really interesting to see in Guatemala. And I'm I'm glad you drew that dichotomy because I do think we, we can't really speak about Central America and South America as the same sort of geographic groups. What's happening in South America and even different parts of South America is different than what's happening in Central America. And Guatemala is one of the, I'm actually I'm doing some research on Guatemala anyway for a, a video that we're putting up um, on YouTube. And Guatemala is one of these fascinating countries. It, it sort of reminds me of Tunisia in a weird way. Tunisia, once the beating heart of the Carthaginian Empire, the sort of world dominant empire that if it hadn't lost the wars to the romans maybe we'd still be talking about the carthaginians but today nobody except nerds like me talk about ancient carthage and what it meant Um, guatemala was the geographic core of mayan civilization and in some ways talking about guatemala today i mean all guatemala is known for today is it's a way station for drugs it's a source of migrants to the north um 
and political corruption and civil war and all these other things. But go back a couple thousand years, this was the geographic core of one of the great civilizations, not just of the Western Hemisphere, but of the world. And as somebody who does geopolitics, you know, it you you look at what happened in Guatemala and you you think, well, I mean, this is a country that it borders the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. It is on this incredibly important strategic real estate. If it could just get its shit together. I mean, could it be Costa Rica on steroids? It, it has shown in its past, you know, geopolitical advantage, but then it also sort of gets into the mystery of the Mayans who disappeared and we don't know why. And it's been just sort of chaos ever since then. So I, I don't know, there's this weird magical realism quality to what's happening in Guatemala. And um, that's why Elohim, I take your point. I'm, I'm glad you're sobering me with your caution, uh, but it's hard. And maybe it's just because we're starved for good news because there's bad news everywhere else in the world. Even the geopolitical realist in me wants to look at Guatemala and wants to believe that this is real. So, Give me two nuances to add to this, which is one is that the question here with the rebel is how are we going to uh, drive this hope into public policies? Mm -hmm. So, and this is what good governments have been in terms of ethics at least have been struggling a lot in the in the few in the, in the last year i'm sorry my baby is here yeah. and we, uh, we, we will cut it all out you don't have to worry about it okay so i will say it again um so public policies at the end of the day will uh, impact uh and will be the the proof that this is really a good thing and Good governments, in terms of ethics, have been struggling a lot uh, in really the de delivery. And the other one is, I agree completely with Nacho that this is not the left that we usually talk in Latin America. But if it goes wrong, it will be framed as left, right? And those populist rights that are trying to arise everywhere in the world, they will they will say that this is one more example of a leftist failure. Which is interesting what you are saying, Elo, because Elohim, right? Because uh, on the one hand, all left parties in presidency in, in Latin America, not in Central America, are struggling with delivery and. Uh, I think there is a big challenge there for Guatemala, right? Because uh, delivery, while you're, while the odds are against you, while the elite is against you, this is very tough to do. It's very tough to show, mm, again, delivery in terms of public policy, uh, big changes in a short period of time, right? Um, uh, it's the main challenge for le leftist presidencies in the region. Uh, but at the same time, it's probably what people are expecting from them, right? Well, and, and just to, to to add to that, though, I mean, um, f first of all, I'm not sure that right and left even map onto this. It's very hard to still speak about the right and left as real terms, because, for instance, Boric is certainly left socially. Is he left economically? I don't know. He feels more neoliberal than anything else to me. But as we're skirting around, it, I think the other thing that makes Guatemala different, especially from a policy point of view, Petro doesn't have... Colombian legislature behind him. He's a minority party, and it was a very, very tight election. Boric, very, very tight election. Peru, very, very tight election. Like you go down the list of where we've got these leftist governments, quote unquote, in South America, they're all very tight races where presidents don't have the support of the legislature or the established forces behind them. And so that's why you don't get any policy. You just get gridlock. That's not what happened with Arevalo. This dude got what, 58, 59% of the vote? He trounced. Um, his opponent. There's no, you, you can't sort of say, okay, well, he's only 20% of the population and people were so fed up that they wanted it. And I think that's the other thing. He, the main message that he articulated and in some, in some ways he's lived it, right? He left Guatemala. He came back because he wanted to make Guatemala a better place. And his entire thing, you know, most leftist governments will say, oh, we don't want to align with the United States. We hate the United States. We have this history of the United States in our country. Guatemala can make that argument better than almost any country in the entire region. That's not what he has to say about the United States. What he has to say to the United States is, hey, I want Guatemalans to stay here and not immigrate to your country. So how can we work together to do development in my country so that we're not sending you these migrants and we're not disagreeing all the time? Like That's not the vocabulary of the leftists. So I, he's, I, I really do think he's something 
he's something different, which maybe is also a good segue unless you guys want to go in there because I don't want to spend the whole time on Guatemala in terms of something different. Uh, in Argentina, I mean, the jokes just make themselves about Javier. I don't even have to say anything. Just go look at what the dude has said. It's absolutely unbelievable. Uh, for the uninitiated listeners, this guy is a self-described tantric sex instructor. Yeah, but like he said, that I, I'm not making this up. So Among, um, among other things, again, beautiful, right? Yes. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, what? <exactly. laughs> so before 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 leaving Nacho to really explain the nuances of his country, I want to underscore this contrast. I think Arevalo in Guatemala is the only vote for hope that that we have seen in at least uh, Spanish speaker Latin American countries. Maybe in Brazil, the discussion with Lula is different, at least in some part of the electorate. But in the Spanish-speaking Latin America, I think that this is the only vote for hope that I've seen in many years. Uh, and this is completely the contrast with Argentina. And maybe Nacho could explain <laughs> us in detail. Wow. Uh, I, I like that because I would like to kind of I try to agree or disagree with that at the same time. I don't know, and th there is a link with Guatemala here as well, because uh, maybe it's not a vote for hope, but it's a vote for change, right? And sometimes those two words are very close to each other in other countries. And uh, taking from where Jacob left, uh, certainly the the left right uh, uh, pattern doesn't that won't fit in any of, of I mean it's not the same scale in any of of all the countries we are mentioning right it's not the same the left in Argentina is not the same as the left in 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 Chile and in Uruguay which are, which are our neighbor countries right and certainly not in Peru certainly not in the U S not in Ecuador. <clears throat> But I, I see there in, in all these countries like a, a, a need for for change, no? right? A, a need for a, a tiredness. A, a, people are exhausted about traditional powers, traditional elites, and they are they are asking for for change. They have been asking for change, and depending on the on the period or the country, uh, change can look very different in all our country, right? For Chile change is the left because it's so many 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 years with the right similar in in, in colombia right <clears throat> and and here in argentina talking about that yeah uh, that's one of the main reasons right people is i mean if you want to to ask yourself how how is it possible that a person who describes himself as this and many other things who wants to close the central bank who wants to dollarize the economy wants to close 11 ministries uh, how how can he have some so much so many followers right and and the, and the explanation partially comes from that need of change right people people saying many, many young people saying okay i haven't seen delivery of policies in the last 16 to 20 years so i'm 21 i don't i don't know i don't know what is delivery i don't i haven't seen delivery uh, from the government in my entire life. Maybe this change, this person who comes from, arguably comes from different background, he, he will provide change. And that is par partially the explanation. So just to let, let, to let it there, between this mix, between hope and change, right? And the similarities and links between them. Well, I, I don't know how much we can apply sort of a U.S. perspective to this, but one thing I find among young people, and especially, I mean, I describe myself as a geriatric millennial, so on the older side of the of the millennial generation. Um, but, you know, uh, millennials, I find, have very, very strong political opinions. And then when you ask them if they voted, they didn't vote. They're not running for office. They're not civically engaged or politically involved. Um, I at least vote. I'm none of the other things. I have friends who, you know, would rail about Trump's not my president or I hate Biden. This, none of them vote. 
None of them care. They don't actually express themselves. And I do think there is some element to that with young people too. It's one of the reasons I thought Boric was so interesting because there's a young person who's actually putting his money where his mouth is. He's saying, no, I want change and we represent students and we represent something real. We would like to have real change. Whereas the idea that young Argentines look at a picture of this Millet dude and they're like, yes, this is the guy that is going to author real substantive change for our country. I mean, it's just kind of like, like, Gen Z and the millennials are really getting dumber if if that's exactly what they think. But I also, you know, before we get too far down the melee whirlpool, it was a primary. He won what roughly thirty percent of the votes cast. I think I saw only sixty percent of Argentines actually voted. So I mean, do, yeah, do you think it's realistic that he becomes president, and if even if he can with any kind of power to make change, or is this? Is, is he just a flash in the pan? Is he not actually going to get elected? And if he is elected, is he just another Petro, except on the other side, with big dreams but no ability to accomplish anything? No, for sure, for sure. So probably nobody knows. There is a general agreement that he won't be able to do most of the things he he's arguing he will do because he doesn't have the power in, in the Senate or in the Chamber of Deputies. And so many of the reforms he, he's pushing he doesn't have the power. That's one. Then the second one, again, with the lack of power is he, there, there has also been many elections in our provinces in the last six months, right? He, he lost like big, he lost big. He, he didn't have any power, any local power to, to kind of try to develop an agenda, a local agenda. So, so although he has a lot of support in the provinces, he doesn't have a structure. Which the other can the other parties they they do have. Uh, <clears throat> so what, once again, there is a general uh, agreement that he won't be able to do many of the things he he's claiming he will do. But in terms of mm, winning the elections, he might, he might, he might as well, because as you said. So the the phrase here is. It, it is that it's a it's an election of thirds, right? Which is a phrase that the former president here in Argentina said in mid-May, five, uh, four, four months ago. There are three big parties, which is unusual. We we don't have us in the U.S. two big countries always running for presidency. <clears throat> here this year we have three, which is unusual anyway. And and from these primary elections, Millet has thirty percent. The second party, which is also right, kind of mid-right, uh, 28%. And then let's call it the middle-left kind of uh, party, 27 So it's it's pretty tight. But they, in general, if, if you sum up the, the votes that are going to the right side of this spectrum, is huge. It's almost 60, 70 percent. So that's that's something that might uh, follow up depending on on how the general elections go, right? And how how the vote is divided between these two countries. But I'm not to 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 uh, move the conversation towards there, but just to pick on something that you said. However, there is still uh, ele- uh, 11 million people that hasn't voted. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, 5%, roughly 12 million people who hasn't actually uh, selected any of these candidates, right? And that might move the, the, <clears throat> the, the general elections. Only this, this spoiled vote, only these 1 million people, they are, they, they are the fourth part. They could be the fourth party, just to say something. They got more votes mm-hmm. than the, the other fifth party. You know what I mean? So. A- anything can happen, actually. But you can pretty safely say that there is a turn to the right, for sure. L- let me let me follow up on two ideas. The first one is that my perspective, and please tell me if in Argentina it's the same within the country. In my perspective, the public discussions, both in social media and in media outlets, it's mostly about Millet. It's like media and social media is talking only about him. So it, it is becoming a one candidate election, right? In the media. And uh, 
So this supports his uh, probabilities, right? So that is one uh, idea. And the other one is, can we really fit? So we already talked about the difficulties to really match left and right. But Millet in particular, who is an, an self a proclamated anarcho libertarian right so he's breaking the the idea of left and right so he's just i don't know if we can say that he's a street a far right guy so what I, i'm sorry that i'm taking this uh, conversation in, in, in I, I am becoming the the one who's making questions but please Nacho, at least a little bit explain me what do you think about it. <laughs> Sorry, I had to plug the computer. <clears throat> oh, you're good. And for sure. Uh, well, th there is a move. It's I have I, I'm almost forty years old. I haven't seen this kind of representative power in Argentina in my in my life, right? And that's that's for people who who has lived all our life, all their, their life after the, the dictatorships, right? After the, mili after the military powers. So for, so my life in my history with democracy in Argentina, I have never seen this, this right. We, we didn't have that, that kind of uh, party in, 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 in Argentina. And we didn't have it, have it, we've had it before, right? So it's, it's certainly, certainly new. And even even what I said before, the representative of this third party, which is kind of let's call it central left, uh, the guy used to be an outsider even for those parties, right? He he, Sergio Massa, which is currently our mis minister of economy, uh, was also a chief of staff for the uh, Kirchnerista government. Right, which is mm, kind of Peronist a little bit uh, to the left, uh, but also his policies on security, on narco traffic, on, on climate, uh, climate change are not necessarily mm, left. Right, in in our terms, are more close to the right. So 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 the so as you said, you know, I I agree with that. The, there is a shift. There is a shift or an expansion of the left, uh, left, right. Uh, uh, what is it? A spectrum, right? And uh, he, even he, who is a representative of the left, is now a central left, central left, central right. So our more li most liberal agenda comes from from that kind of left, right. which is unusual. Is certainly really, really unusual. So for me, I have studied international relations and I, I, I cannot unsee this in terms of the, the patterns in the region, right? The, the actual left, our traditional left, doesn't exist here. While, while in Peru there is, there was in power, in, in Chile very different, but there, there is, in Uruguay there is. <clears throat> Again, right, uh, our left doesn't exist. Uh, um, and might disappear. I don't think so. Uh, they usually take two to three percent of the of the population vote each every four years. They repeated this again. Um, so uh, maybe maybe the there is not only a shift, but maybe an expansion. Right? We have many 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 other options on the spectrum. And, and, and then, you know, Jacob, we, I, don't know I think we're, we're, you, we're, you we're, to oh, see, yeah. right. well, just that we're, we're taught to think of politics as a spectrum, but I'm not sure that it is a spectrum. I think of it more as a circle. So you, st if you go down the, the right path, you will eventually run into the left. If you keep walking, like you're not just going to walk off the center of the earth, which is why I wanted to jokingly ask Elohim, Elohim, if we could go back in time and I could tell you, you can trade Pedro Castillo for Millet right after he was elected. Would you, would you like that? Or would you not like that? <laughs> <laughs> Say it again, please. That, that was a very out of out of the box question. I know. I'm, I mainly <laughs> wanted the, your your face on the video when I asked you the question. Like, but would would you prefer uh, would you prefer Millet or would you prefer Pedro Castillo? <laughs> <laughs> 
Because, I mean, to me, once you start getting in this weird, populo, anarcho, liberal, blah, 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 all this stuff is the same. It's all just change and populism, and we'll say whatever we, we need to say to go there. So it was kind of a half-joking question that I wanted to see a reaction to, and feel free to answer it. But if the, I have to deeper, choose, yeah, go. If, if I, had, if I did have to, to pick between cancer and HIV, okay, in this case, so the, the thing here is that Millet has a technical discussion in men, at least in economy. And that is huge in terms that we can disagree, but he's one step forward in the policy discussion. And that is why so many politicians, not only in Argentina, maybe, but in the region, are off side because. The center, the center left, the center right, those moderated people that maybe we here consider part of, we don't have new remedies. We are just repeating ourselves. We, we are imitating ourselves. And after the progressive reforms in Latin America, from Lula in Brazil in the first term and Mexico during the 2000s too, we just started to repeat ourselves. So the moderated people is not innovating in terms of policy. And this guy comes with completely crazy ideas, even more for Argentina, as Nacho just explained. And he starts the discussion that left, again, everybody outside, uh, offside. So that is why, to your question, I think... I give that to Millet. I have okay. to give him that. Jacob, would you mind if I add on this just to, just to fight a little? Please, I, I'd, li I'd like. Would, would, would you rather have Pedro Castillo than Millet at, at the, <laughs> as the front runner? No, you can I have agree. The question too. First of all, I agree with your with the uh, course shoe a theory that the extremes find each other very closely in these cases. So I don't like extremes in general, and even less these kind of extremes. I agree with with that on that with Elo. Uh, but at the same time, just because I haven't fought with, with Elohim in a, in a long time now, uh, elections are becoming a product of states and statements, right? And I, and I get what, what Elohim is saying, you know, like me, me, some, some people like Castillo, they made the elections based on ideological statements while uh, Millet do their campaign based on technical statements. But they are, at the end of the day, statements, right? Um, um, and, and, and I think that's, that's also connected with what, with what you were saying, hello, before, right? Um, well, I, ha I had seen this process in the U.S. when I was living there and many other countries, right? <clears throat> this, this use, this statement, fits perfectly with social media, right? This short type kind of real history uh, kind of message. So there is a connection there between the statement, social media, and young people, right? The consumers of this kind of, 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 of media, right? And exactly as you were saying, Elohim, and there is a connection. There are many studies here that says that Nobody has had more open TV minutes than the Millet since 2018 until today. At some point, it was a matter of powers and people giving him that space. Currently, it's more of the agenda is uh, deep into talking about why and how is it all this possible, right? But on the other hand, of yeah. let me tell you something yeah. about it, Nacho. Oh, yes. One thing about it. In all the conversations here, you have not mentioned the name of the other two candidates. That is a symptom of the situation everywhere, I think. It For sure. And when we, we, could, we, could talk, we could talk about them as well, right? I think that, uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's a matter of interest for us to under try to understand how it how, how is this possible, right? And, and, and that's why I think we all, including media, talk about him, right? But also because sometimes statements are 
so powerful, the clickbait, right? Lead us to read more and more and listen more. And, and they are the only, he's the only person and that's the only party doing that. Yeah. It was his strategy, but and nowadays it's, it has become a matter of that's all what it is on the agenda now. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it's it's junk food. It's like diabetes of the brain in a way. You just keep consuming the thing that is there in front of you. But in some ways, I think it's not about should we talk about the other candidates. I think the real question with Argentina, it doesn't really matter who wins, whether it's right or left, or whether his dogs are also in you know the presidential palace, things like that. If we got together in four years from now, is Argentina going to be any meaningfully different? Are they going to have paid back the IMF? Are they going to be realizing all of this potential? They should be the greatest economic power of South America. They aren't. Like, are, is any of this symbolizing a real change? Or are we going to be back here in four years talking about whichever candidate is even crazier than Millet because that's how they're going to get votes? Perfect. Uh, yeah, uh, that's that. I agree. That's the main concern and that's the main question. I would say that unless something really, really unexpected for all of us happens there won't be a big change, which is not necessarily bad in terms of what you ask. Are we going to stop paying the uh, MFI? We won't. There is a general con consent that we, we have to pay and we will pay. There are few, very, very few countries, that are, uh, parties that are saying that we shouldn't pay. Uh, <clears throat> um, it's, it's just that uh, how how are you going to do with with the other variables is what we, we, we don't know. What I, mean, what I mean is we still have 39% of the population under poverty, right? 88% of the population under extreme poverty. Um, so in terms of the labor for, force, out of 13 million people, 6.5 works still in the informal sector, right? And they are also sending their votes to uh, Millet, regardless of the current situation, whether they have money or not, they want to to be in the formal sector, right? And those are the changes that we might see. I think the agenda will go will go there, but in terms of big changes regarding uh, our connections with other countries, no big changes in all our uh, main parties. In terms of paying our debt, no big changes between our, our parties. Uh, fighting narco traffic, no, no big, big changes between our parties. Well, so last question in Argentina before we uh, uh, turn a field, and you can both answer this one if you want. Um, would you advise an investor to invest in Argentina over the next four years? Well, <clears throat> you, you probably know this, um, Tokyo, with, with that kind of public as well, right? When you bet on Argentina, you are taking a big risk. <laughs> how how worse can it go? You, you never know, but it, it doesn't look like we have many many room, right? Uh, people is comparing this situation to our worst situation, worst situation in the last mm, 70, 70 years, right? So <clears throat> I'm not optimistic in, in like just because, but I think it cannot get worse, right? If you uh, know where to invest, there are very good chances. Chances, And uh, let me say this clearly. If you are investing in energy, Argentina is a great place, place to invest. A mm -hmm. lot of resources. Lithium is kind of the new star in our country, lithium in our country, in, in, in Chile as well, but here, uh, like only a few companies investing here on that. Uh, oil in general, uh, forestry. If you are trying to invest on, on that, I think Argentina is a really good option for you. And some other sectors, mm, uh, you should see. The risk is big, the opportunity <laughs> is also big. And I think it cannot get much worse than today. Let me let me add, add something before uh, going to Ecuador. Yep. I'm pretty sure that we're going to spend a few minutes there. Mm -hmm. There is a comparison that people are doing about uh, Peru in the 90s and Argentina right now. So we had this outsider, Fujimori, right? 
he was more quiet in that moment. The one who offered the shock was Vargas Llosa, but he failed in saying that this shock would affect people. This is not Millet's discourse. Maybe he learned or he has uh, advisors, right? But the general idea is that Millet could come with this shock, economic shock that Fujimori did in the 90s. And this, so the first uh, analogy is that outsider. The second one is the economic shock that the, the country needs. And the third one, and this is more a gray space, is to what extent Millet should require authoritarian methods to really deliver. And uh, this is the big question, I think. From my perspective, listening to him, he would have no doubt to try it, to attempt it. The question is if the Argentinian population would allow him to do it. Um, well, on that note, let's let's turn to our last country to talk about. And I don't know that we're going to get to the broader question about crime in Latin America. We'll probably have to come back to that in a future episode because I know that we, we all have meetings that we have to go to um, in the next 15 minutes. So let's just spend the time talking about Ecuador. Ecuador is the most, at least for me, the most depressing of these three countries that we're talking about. Um, it's also in some ways the least important. So you know, I've, I've been prioritizing research on Guatemala and Argentina this week because those are actually very geopolitically significant, very significant from an investment pers perspective, et cetera. Um, Ecuador, sorry to the Ecuadorians that are listening, all three of you, not that important. I mean, this is a this is terrible news for you. I feel for you, but like it's not really going to affect things at that global level. And so I've just had to prioritize research on the other two and I'm not quite up as, quite as up to date on Ecuador. So I'm going to lean on you guys, especially for this part of the conversation. What we can say is that they had an anti-corruption type crusader candidate, sort of their version of Arevalo in Guatemala. And rather than winning in a landslide, he got cut down and assassinated before we even got to the presidential election. And that really kind of sums up where Ecuador is. I have a family friend who um, uh, has lived in Ecuador now for, I think, over a decade. And I saw him a couple of years ago, I guess a year ago now, um, at, a, at my cousin's wedding. Shout out to, to my cousins if they're listening to this. And I, I joked to him, oh, I'm looking for good, good opportunities that nobody's thinking about in South America. You live in Ecuador. You must think great things about it. And he said, no, it's terrible. Like It's just my, my family's here. So that's the only reason I'm here. But it's terrible. Nobody should think anything optimistic about Ecuador. And that turned out to be right. So help, help me tie together what, what, what happened in Ecuador and what that means here in the broader conversation that we're having. I said in the beginning that we have different messages for the region, for each country, right? Mm -hmm. And the message here, and this is a topic that we were, maybe we won't develop, but it's to what extent criminal organizations can really entangle in these kind of countries. We have seen that in, in Mexico, maybe not in a national level, but in a regional or city level, it is there. Um, I say maybe. Um, then, in, so in Ecuador, uh, this is a big question that I'm, I'm having in my mind, is that criminal organizations killed this guy, this presidential candidate, because he was claiming that he, he was going to confront them. So my question is, and I don't have an, one single answer, is why the others are not afraid enough? So you have similar ways of understanding this. So the other candidates, the, the potential uh, presidents. So it's, are they with them? Will they be soft with, with them? Are they going to attack them without mentioning them? So why this guy and not the others? And this is a message in other ways for the region too, because this is not one single local organization only going against a, a presidential candidate. It's international criminal organizations going against the presidential candidate in the same way that 
an attorney from Paraguay was killed in Colombia by Brazilian organizations. Now you have here a presidential candidate who was killed by local organizations, but it seems coordinated that it was coordinated with cartels in Mexico. So I think that is a message for the region. It is a message that it is starting in Ecuador, but they are becoming braver. They are becoming a more confident and entitled to really confront publicly the political so the political organizations to confront publicly the the political establishment. So I am afraid that if we have the same people, the same policies, so the same politicians, the same policies, and the same criminal organizations without any change, setting is paribus, this only could increase. Mm. Just, just, just to add on that, I think we, we all have, <clears throat> I don't know if more question, questions than answers, but I also see that pattern, right? And, I, and I don't, I'm not moving to, to the other discussion, but for me, Ecuador was kind of an island, right? <clears throat> and certainly as Ecuador, certainly as Argentina, traditionally not uh, drug producer countries, Mm, at the most, but not 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 really uh, transport related country. I mean, drug drug transporting countries. They were only consumers, right, of drugs and those and, and, and of the products of these drug cartels. So traditionally, it's safe, safe, safe countries, right? Uh, this is a show of power uh, for me. <clears throat> And again, trying to relate it to our conversation today, right? Um, we, uh, Jacob was talking about, is it go, is it closer to uh, Guatemala? Is closer to Costa Rica, or is is it's going to be closer to Honduras? Uh, for me, <clears throat> uh, Ecuador has that had that same kind of divide, potentially divided opinion, right? Is it going to be closer to um, narcotraffic in Colombia or? to other, or maybe the situation in, in Venezuela or to some other Andean countries like maybe Peru, which we all know the history as well, right? <clears throat> and, and for me, this, 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 this is frightening me because there are shows of new places where narco-traffic and the uh, organized crime is, is sent, right? And new levels of violence, which as an investor, if you see the big picture, Latin America is 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 uh, dangerous. But if you if you see country by country, these are not considered traditionally dangerous countries, um, and these are new levels of of violence. And ju just to finish, also in, in in relation to our conversation of delivery, right? When whenever you you analyze. Uh, drug trafficking and organized crime, they try to enter in places where the government doesn't enter, right? So again, the conversation on delivery of public policies, I think is very important because um, the success on new governments in on providing delivery and getting the public policies to, to closer to the people will end up uh, leaving free room for the orga for organized crime to enter or not so i think that, that that's that's a good challenge and a cliffhanger for maybe other conversation in, in ecuador as well jacob a couple of ideas that about the relevance of this election in ecuador maybe one for you your audience in particular is the parallel election that was happening there is the, the that they voted against the uh, oil extractions in the Yasuni uh, uh, National Park, and uh, mm -hmm. they voted to ban uh, mineral extraction in the Andes region next to Quito, the capital city. And I think that is very important in terms of a geopolitical uh, impact for business. Uh, on the other side, if the left 
wings. Here maybe it's more clear because you have this, uh, you have Luisa Gonzalez who is leading the the, the first round, uh, who is very close to Rafael Correa. Uh, you could find that some old school, in terms of 20 years ago, regional uh, group is consolidating again. As you have the left it with Ecuador, the left with Bolivia, the left with Brazil, now the left with Colombia too. So you can have, uh, again, this map of different kinds of reds, but that could talk to each other. So I think that is also important. And if the other one wins, uh, Noboa, who is the son of a very well-recognized uh, banana uh, businessman, he has studied all his life in the U.S. So he has three master's degree, one in, in, in George Washington, one in Harvard, and one in uh, Kellogg's in, here in the Northwestern. So I think that is important in terms of who, will, who, who he will look, look uh, at, even if in some moment, at some point, he had relationship also with Russia. We didn't talk about it here, but all these changes in the region will have an impact, all these three elections, in the relationship with China and with the U.S. In diff to different extents. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's there's like three cliffhangers in there, but I know you guys have to run at the top of the hour, so I, I don't want to open up a can of worms that we can't do appropriately. So let's just say, gentlemen, this was a great first three-way podcast on Riverside. We will have you back on in the next four to six weeks maximum. And you know, I think we've laid out a really nice sort of opening salvo into thinking about some of these big big picture issues in the region. We can dive a little bit deeper next time we talk. So thank you so much for your time and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much, Ego. It was also a pleasure. Yeah. To continue with the Chief Hunters. Yes, yes, next time with the beer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I also enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Jacob, for the invitation. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.